You're listening to Qalam Institute's podcast. Visit us on the web at qalaminstitute.org and join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash qalaminstitute. Bismillahi walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Inshallah, we're continuing with our seerah, uh, our series on the seerah, the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In last week's session, we actually were talking about the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam coming to the age of marriage. And the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ver- um, entertained or was approached by a few different proposals. Some of the books of Sirah talk about this. But the very first serious proposal for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that was proposed to him and he was also very serious about it was the proposal from Khadija radiallahu anha. We started off by talking about the career, the life, the, the, the professional life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how he, he was a businessman by trade. And the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam undertook a couple of very serious uh, business journeys early on for Khadija radiallahu anha, Khadija bint Khwailid, a very wealthy businesswoman in Mecca at that time. But the only way for her to be able to invest her money was to engage in a business practice that is called mudaraba, where basically somebody invests the money and somebody else puts forth the effort or the energy, the time. So, and this is actually a system of doing business that the Prophet ﷺ advocated much, much later on than in the Medinan period once the Islamic State was being established and the Prophet ﷺ was now educating the Muslim Ummah and the community on even business ethics. The Prophet of Allah ﷺ encouraged the practice of mudaraba. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this um, at the beginning of this session. I, I didn't address it last week. So, you know, from all phases and all aspects of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, even pre-Nubuwa, pre-Prophethood, there's always something for us to learn and for us some, something that we can gain from the life of the Prophet ﷺ in general. His very first experience of doing serious business was, he was a young man in his early 20s. He did not possess any wealth, of course, you know, he was an orphan. His father had passed away before he was born. The man who was his guardian and his caretaker, Abu Talib, was a poor man himself, a very respectable, very dignified man, but just wasn't very wealthy at all. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't have any money to start off a business with. And I talked about this last week, about how the Prophet ﷺ basically started off by doing business where, you know, initially first he worked with another individual, Asaib bin Abi Sa'ib, he worked with him as um, agents, if you will. They were brokers, they were agents, um, where they would kind of connect the wholesaler with the retailer and they were the middlemen. And once they made a little bit of money with this, but still to be able to do serious business where they were going to Syria to sell goods and they were bringing goods back from Asham to sell back in Hijaz and in Mecca, they needed a lot of capital. They didn't possess it. The Prophet ﷺ didn't have it. So how was he going to go about in doing this business? Well, the Prophet of Allah ﷺ went to work for somebody. And it was a partnership. And that partnership is the arrangement that even the uh, ancient Arabs, they called the mudaraba. Where you have two sides doing business. One side with the money, the other side with the actual work. And then they share the profits accordingly, depending on how vital the work or the money is to that particular business. They will split the profits accordingly. And the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, decades later when he would give the sharia, when he would outline the sharia to the Muslims and the people and eventually the ummah worldwide, the Prophet of Allah ﷺ emphasized and encouraged the practice of mudaraba. And if we look today, that actually is the answer and the solution to the situation that we see in the world today. You see, in the Islamic code of ethics and in, in fiqh al-mu'amalat, in the Islamic view of doing business, money, wealth, anything of monetary value, currency, is not a commodity, is not a merchandise itself. Therefore, you really can't sell money. And the, so the whole practice of money lending that we have today, that is at the core and the root of much of the world's problems today, you know, the whole 1%, occupy this and occupy that, the whole 1%, this whole f- fiasco, this catastrophe, catastrophe that we have on our hands, it happens due to money lending. Because money al- lending allows the rich to become richer and the poor to become poorer. And that's the essence, at the, that's the core of it. Because you sell the money to somebody who doesn't have money. Versus that what Islam advocates, Islam doesn't allow for money lending. 
The practice of the Prophet ﷺ, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, the sharia of Muhammad ﷺ says no money lending. Yes, you can take loans, but it does not encourage the taking of loans. The Prophet ﷺ himself took a loan to show us that it's permissible. Ja'iz, mubah, yajuz. It's permissible. But he didn't encourage it. In fact, he used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for protection from falling into debt. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-maghrami wal ma'thami. He used to seek refuge. He would take refuge from Allah. He would ask Allah for, for protection from falling into debt. And so while it's permissible, the Prophet ﷺ did not encourage it. In fact, discouraged it. As this dua, this supplication of the Prophet ﷺ, that some of the riwayat say, the Prophet ﷺ used to say this at the end of his tashahud in every single salah. This is from the ad'iya of the morning and evening. This is from the morning and evening supplications. So he discouraged even the taking of loans. Then how, how, how are things going to work? What does somebody who has a lot of money, more money than he needs, what's he supposed to do with it? I understand there's sadaqah and charity, but Islam doesn't tell us that we just have to give our money away for free. There's nothing wrong with investing your money and making more money out of your, more, out of your money. I mean, that was a practice of the Sahaba. Abdurrahman bin Awf, Uthman ibn Affan. They were extremely generous men. They were very, very charitable. But at the same time, they made money. I mean, it's mentioned during the Khilafah, I believe, of Umar ibn Khattab or Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhuma, that Abdurrahman bin Awf radiallahu anhu, one of his business caravans arrived back into Medina. And the city of Medina, granted, was a lot smaller than it is today, but still that business caravan, it was so huge. They were just bringing the merchandise of Abdurrahman bin Auf that they had purchased in Asham and they had brought it to Medina to sell in the Hijaz region, that the whole caravan was so huge that the front camel was on one end of the border of the city of Medina and the last camel was on the other border, across. That's how huge it was. And there's a very beautiful story which shows how they, while they made money and they had money, they weren't attached to their money. Aisha radiallahu anha heard a lot of commotion. So she looked outside and she saw this huge business caravan. So she asked somebody, she said, who is this for? Who does this belong to? So somebody told her, this is Abdurrahman bin Auf. This is his business. This is his merchandise arriving. His inventory. Aisha radiallahu anha goes to Abdurrahman bin Auf radiallahu anhu and she congratulates him. She says, MashaAllah, a lot of you know, your merchandise just arrived and definitely congratulations. Looks like business is going well. And then she said, do you remember what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told you? Do you remember what he told you? That one time the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was giving the, the, the good news of paradise, when he was giving the bashara of Jannah, he was giving the good news of paradise. He was congratulating the Jannati Sahaba. That congratulations, you're going to go to Jannah. Abu Bakr, you're the inna lil Jannati thamaniyatu abu abu anta tunada min kulli bab. There are eight gates of paradise, and your name will be called out from all eight gates. Umar, I saw your palace in paradise. It was so unbelievably awesome, I thought it was mine. Except when I tried to go in, they said, no, this belongs to Umar. And then he goes on and on telling them different good news and he tells Abdurrahman bin Auf, he goes, you will go to paradise. That's your good news. But he said, you're gonna get left behind. He says, why, O Messenger of Allah? Why, why am I going to get left behind? This is Abdurrahman bin Auf. This is one of the only two individuals who, behind whom the Prophet ﷺ has ever prayed. So this is an amazing man. So he says, why, O Messenger of Allah? Why will I get left behind? And he said, because you're wealthy accounting all the accounting of your wealth is gonna cause you to lag behind just a little bit. So she goes, you remember what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi told you? That's all she says. Abdurrahman bin Auf, eyes became filled with tears. He became very, very concerned. He became very, like just, just really he was hit by it. He was affected by it. And immediately he tells the people, the people working for him, he goes, I want you to take all of this, just drive this over, just walk this straight over to the Baytul Mal and tell the Khalifa that this is my contribution to the Baytul Mal. It's all sadaqah, it's all charity. It's given away. So, but nevertheless, the, so I, I only told the story to demonstrate the fact Sahaba made money. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had to give us a solution. How are we supposed to make money? What are we supposed to do? If, if money lending is not a practice, you don't lend more money for, you don't lend money for more money, then how do we do that? What are they supposed to do with their money? Just give it away for free? No, you can make money. And then the practice the Prophet emphasized was called mudaraba, 
where you go into business with somebody who's got some skill, who's got some time, who's got some energy, who's got some effort, but he doesn't have the capital, he doesn't have the money. You got a lot of money, but you got no time on your hands. You're already running 10 businesses. And you got a bunch more money that you don't know what to do with. So in, inshallah, first and foremost, focus on giving sadaqah and charity. But if you are looking to grow your money and invest your wealth somewhere, the Prophet said, get into business together. That way what happens? That somebody else who had the skill and the talent and the drive and the motivation, you facilitate business for that person. And both of y'all make money together. And if you lose, both of y'all lose together. This way there's no one, you know, in the system we have today, there's, there's, no matter what happens, the person lending the money will win. That person always wins. Without fail, that person will win. And it puts the, the, the chances of losing solely on the other party, the one that's borrowing the money. So this was the practice, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is what he emphasized to us as an ummah. This is something we have to revive within our communities. And this was from the own early experience of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Something very interesting about the Prophet of Allah ﷺ. I wanted to talk about this again last week. I didn't get a chance to talk about it. The Prophet of Allah ﷺ did business. He was a businessman. Something very interesting about Islam and the advice and the guidance from the Prophet ﷺ. He doesn't give advice or guidance that he himself doesn't have experience of. Meaning it's always very practical, it's always very relevant, and the Prophet was credible about whatever he talked about. When the Prophet told us about family, he had credibility. He was an amazing husband, an amazing father. When the Prophet of Allah told us about business, he had credibility. The one time the Prophet recommended something to the Sahaba was about farming, cross-pollination. He told them, really? Why do you do that? Why do you cross-pollinate the date palms and the date trees and... He goes, don't do that. It sounds weird. And if, you know, he was just talking to them. Sahaba radiallahu anhum, ma atakumu rasulu, fakhuduhu. Wa ma nahakum anhu, fantahu. What he tells you to do, take it. When he tells you to stop, stop. So he said, that's it. We're not going to cross pollinate. That year they had a terrible crop. So they come back to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and they say, oh Messenger of Allah, we're having a lot of trouble with the crop, the harvest this year. You told us not to cross-pollinate, and so we didn't, and we ran into a lot of issues and problems. He goes, I was just talking to you guys. I was just asking, like, why do you do that? That sounds weird. He goes, Antum a'lamu bi umuri dunyakum. He goes, you know what you're doing. Go do what you're supposed to do. What am I supposed to know? Why are you asking me? Go do what you're supposed to do. So the Prophet of Allah he wasn't a farmer, he had no experience in agriculture. So the Prophet wouldn't make recommendations. This is part of the divine system, the guidance. That's why the Messenger of Allah qualifies as Uswatun Hasana. Otherwise that title wouldn't fit. So when the Prophet tells us about business ethics, the ethics of doing business, how to be honest, how to be fair, he's not talking just out of nowhere. He's not shooting in the dark. He's not guesstimating. But rather he's talking from a frame of reference. He has a concrete reference to where he's referring back to. He was a very successful businessman himself. And that gave him the ability to give practical advice. Similarly, when the Messenger of Allah teaches us how to merge together a spiritual life, a business life, and a family life, he's talking from experience because this was a father, a husband, a messenger, and a businessman. And a head of state eventually. So he talks from a very solid frame of reference. He's credible. And these, these seerah lectures, when we study the life of the Prophet it's is not just to tell the story, but it's to really extract the lessons and to be able to practically implement, implement it in our own life. One personal experience I have where I was taught a lesson through this example of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ is a little bit, some, this is a bit personal, but something personal about myself is that I you know, went to school and after high school I went overseas to go study. And when I graduated from my studies overseas and I came back home, the, the fact of the matter was that I hadn't worked a day in my life. I really didn't know what work was like. Like even if, mashallah, somebody's a doctor now or somebody's an engineer or somebody's a lawyer, somebody's very successful, they got some stories to tell. They got some real life work experience. Even that is work. But you understand what I'm saying. They used to flip burgers or they used to change tires or they used to make deliveries. They've done that type of hard work to where they understand what it took to get to where they're at right now. 
I didn't have any type of real life work experience and typically what happens in these cases a lot of times and I'm not criticizing, I'm just stating the fact as it is that a lot of times you study overseas right after high school or maybe you go during high school and you go study Islamic studies for eight years, ten years and then you come back and then you become an imam of a masjid and you come into that position of leadership which is nothing wrong with it, it's actually great. But what ends up missing a lot of times is you don't know what the real world is like. See, the Prophet of Allah didn't just wake up one day, he didn't just grow up to be an adult and then all of a sudden become the messenger of God and then he was just preaching. But when the Prophet of Allah is talking to somebody who's struggling and balancing out their business life, their professional, their business along with their prayer, or they're struggling with balancing family time and work time, he's talking, he knows what he's talking about, he has real life experience. So what was very interesting was, even though I didn't understand it at the time and many other people in my community and locality didn't understand it either, was when I graduated and came back, my one of my main teachers and my mentor, he told me that um, when you go back, I don't want you taking right away, and this sounds shocking, I don't want you taking like an imam job or an imam position. I want you to give khutbah, I want you to give lectures, I want you to run a youth group, I want you to do the work, but I don't want you to become a full-time imam right off the bat. Okay, why? What am I supposed to do then? I mean, I gotta make a living, I wanna get settled down, I wanna get married. So he said, I want you to go and get some type of a regular job. And because primarily my qualifications, my credentials were Islamic, it's not like I qualified to go work at a, at a computer firm or an IT job or something like that, I couldn't do that. So I said, well, the only type of job I'm gonna be able to get is like labor, it's just work. He's like, do that and get some real life experience. Know what it's like for people who just work and what that's like. And so Alhamdulillah, I did that for about a year and a half or so. And after that, I taught at the university and eventually then, you know, uh, working in the community, being an imam and educating the community. But during that whole time, I always kept up giving khutbah and giving lectures and stuff. But it, he said it's from the sunnah, from the life of the Prophet Wasallam. Before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him a Nabi, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him Risala and Nubuwa and gave him Wahi, He first made him live a normal life. He made him be a businessman, he made him be a husband and a father and all these things. And then he gave him Wahi. So that the message of Wahi, when he would deliver it, when he would preach it, when he would teach it, when he would help people live the life that Allah wanted them to live, he understood where they were coming from. He knew what was going on with them, he knew what it took to make it happen. And so that's a very practical lesson from the sunnah, the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the seerah here, that the Messenger of Allah ﷺ was a businessman. And then specifically one of the things he benefited from was this arrangement of mudaraba. And he saw how beneficial it was and that's why he encouraged it. And that's why it's from the recommendations of the Prophet ﷺ that we uh, implement the system of mudaraba within our communities. Now, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and I talked about this last week as well, about how the Prophet ﷺ was first a businessman, meaning first he worked, first he established at least some form of income, some way of being able to support his family, and then he got married. In fact, there are some narrations in some of the books of Sirah that he, when he was approached by uh, his uncle, Abu Talib, asking him, he said, Muhammad, you are of the age of marriage, marriage. wouldn't you like to get married? That the Prophet of Allah actually responded to his uncle by saying that first I need to make a living. I need to, be, I'm not working. How am I going to support my family? Again, it's from the life of the Prophet Responsibility. Doesn't mean you become rich. We're not talking about $100,000 weddings. And we're not talking about $50,000 mahars. We're not talking about that nonsense. That's what goes on today. But we're also not talking about the other opposite extreme where, that's it. I, have, I pray five times a day. I can get married now, inshallah. Both of us are going to sit together, we're going to make dua, and Allah is going to send down biryani from the sky for us. Right? So there's, there's some practicality, there's some sensibility. And that's from, again, the life and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So now that the Prophet ﷺ is doing business, and we talked about his business journeys last week, and how ethical, how moral, how upright, how honest, how amazing he was, that the Prophet of Allah ﷺ comes back, and the slave Maysara, who was traveling with the Prophet ﷺ, gives the full report to Khadija. The Prophet ﷺ made more profit than any other businessman that Khadija had ever done business with, had ever made before. So she of course compensated him with twice the, um, twice the commission that she had ever given to anyone before. 
And at that point in time, over time, she became very impressed with the character and the honesty of the Prophet ﷺ. She spoke to her cousin and her uncle about the Prophet ﷺ saying, what do you think about Muhammad? And they said, we think he's an amazing young man. He's great. He's very honest. He's very noble. He's very upright. You've done business with him. He seems to be very honest as well in business. And then he, she speaks to her friend Nafisa or Nufaisa. It could be pronounced either way. And she speaks to him and says, what do you know about Muhammad? She says, I think he'd be great for you. So then she says, but how do I know if Muhammad is interested in getting married or not? If he would even consider or not? So her friend says, leave that to me, let me take care of that. She comes to the Prophet of Allah and says, have you thought about getting married? And he said, of course, but who? That's, everybody wants to get married, but who? That's the real question. So she says, what about Khadija? Would you consider Khadija? He goes, absolutely. I mean, she's a very admirable person. Good akhlaq, honest, trustworthy, upright, you know, every quality you would want in a partner, in a spouse. And at that time, the Prophet ﷺ asks Nafisa the same question, Khadija's friend, he says, but how do I know she's interested? She goes, leave that to me, let me take care of that. And so this is how the deals kind of worked out. So she goes back to Khadija radiallahu anha and says, Muhammad's interested. So Khadija radiallahu anha then talks to her uncle. There are some narrations, now here's a difference of opinion in the books of Sirah. The vast majority of the books of Sirah say that the brother and the uncle of Khadija radiallahu anha are the ones who oversaw the nikah, the marriage, the proposal of Khadija radiallahu anha for the Prophet sallallahu and there, are, there is a small minority of some of the books of Sirah that actually say no, it was Khadija's own father, Khuwaylid. So there's a little bit of a difference of opinion here. Um, nevertheless, it's, it's a very small detail. So they go to... Um, so now Khadija, from her family, they send the official marriage proposal. And they call for the Prophet ﷺ to come and meet them, meet her and meet the family and officially have the marriage proposal go through. Khadija radiallahu anha addresses the Prophet ﷺ. Now this is a little bit of a different scenario. And even Islamically in Islamic fiqh, in fiqh nikah this is taken into consideration that a woman who's never been married before is primarily represented. And typically because of, um, it's a very, you know, it, it's a... It's a very challenging experience for a young girl who's never been married before. So typically, just it works out that way socially, um, the father or the wali, whoever the wali might be, uncle, older brother, etc., is the one who mainly speaks on her behalf and represents her. And nikah-wise, like fiqh-wise, it is the wali who represents the girl. But in our, even in our fiqh, this is taken into consideration that if a woman is what is called a thayyib, means she has previously been married. Either she's divorced or widowed, that's, that's besides the point. But as long as she has been married before, then she's actually allowed to represent herself. She does not require the consent of the wali and she can speak for herself. Because typically once a woman, especially like Khadija radiallahu anha, who was, we typically know, the Sunday school answer is that the Prophet sallallahu when he got married, how old was he everybody? 25 years old. I call these Sunday school questions, right? And how old was Khadija radiallahu anha when the Prophet ﷺ got married to her? 40. There is actually a very significant school of thought, like a group of scholars that are of the opinion that Khadija radiallahu anha was actually younger than 40. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah himself is amongst them who relying upon the narration of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma says that Khadija radiallahu anha was in her possibly even early to mid 30s. So there is a significant school of thought. The more popular opinion that was typically written in the, um, or that was present in the books of Sirah, that became more popular was the age of 40, and there might be some truth to that, but nevertheless there is a significant amount of scholars of the Sirah, of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, that are of the opinion that no Khadira radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her, she was actually younger than 40. Some go as far as saying there's actually a narration from Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma where he swears, he says, I swear by Allah she was not a day older than 28. So there are some opinions that say as, as young as 28, but it seems to be Ibn Kathir rahimahullah himself also says that what seems more plausible to me and more da, as, a, as a reliable scholarly academic position is that she was around her mid-30s. 
35, 36, around this age. Wallahu ta'ala alam, Allah knows best. But nevertheless, she was around that age of about 35 to 40 years old. And so she had been married, so she's somebody who's been married before, she's a middle-aged woman, she's a very successful businesswoman, and somebody who's lived some life and very confident, she was more than you know, comfortable speaking on her own behalf. So when the Prophet ﷺ comes for the marriage proposal, she actually addresses the Prophet ﷺ. She says, Yabna Ammi. She says, which means, O oh, son of my uncle. What that means is that's a term of respect. It's a term of respect or endearment. Meaning, by saying that, and people would address each other like that. Like when uh, Musa alayhi salam is really angry and frustrated when he comes back, and he's basically lashing out at Harun, his brother. Harun alayhi salam addresses him by calling him, Yabna Um, son of my mother. Right? So when you say a term like that, when you address someone like that, it's like you're showing respect to their father, to their mother. Yabna Khalati. Or Yabna Ammi, O son of my aunt, O son of my uncle, means you show respect to their parents. Like when I meet the father of my friend, I address him as uncle. Even if he's not related to me, I call him uncle because he's my friend's father. Right? So it's a term of respect and endearment. So she addresses the Prophet by saying, Yabna Ammi, Inni qadr raghibtu fika li qarabatik. That I am interested in marrying you because of your relationships in your family and how you maintain your relationships. Wawastika fi qawmika and how you are the best of your people. Wa amanatika and your honesty, your trustworthiness, wa husni khulqika and because of your excellent character, wa sidqi hadithika and because of how you know honest you are in your speech. You don't lie, you don't deceive, you're a very honest, straightforward person, and that's why I'm interested in you. Now, so she addresses the Prophet ﷺ, and then she basically says that, you know, I, therefore I'd like to um, ask for, I'd like to basically propose to you, I'd like to present this proposition of marriage. The Prophet ﷺ actually speaks about Khadija radiallahu anha as well, and the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi refers to her as Awsata Nisa'i Qurayshi Nasaban That she is the most honorable and dignified of the women of Quraysh when it comes to her family and her family background Wa'a'adhamuhunna sharafan And she's the most dignified and honorable woman of Quraysh And so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi also praises her qualities and her character and her honor and her dignity So he also praises her akhlaq, her character and at that point in time, the Prophet of Allah ﷺ goes and speaks to his own uncles, speaks to his family, and says that this is the marriage proposal that I have, what do you think? And the uncles of the Prophet ﷺ say, we like this marriage proposal, as long as you're okay with it, we're good with it as well. And so now they all leave together, all right? Those who speak Urdu, it's called the Barat, right? So now they all basically leave together and the Prophet ﷺ is with them and they say, Hamza radiallahu anhu, who was an uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, but he was also his um, foster brother through milk. And he was very close in age to the Prophet ﷺ. So he was always like an older brother figure to the Prophet ﷺ. And he was very overprotective of the Prophet ﷺ from the very beginning. So he's the one who speaks on the Prophet ﷺ's behalf. And they, they come to the house of Khadija where her uncle and one the narration says that her father is there. And Hamza radiallahu anhu basically says that we've come here with our, um, with our son, our nephew, this, this very you know, cherished, uh, young man from our family, Muhammad, and we're here for him to be able to marry your daughter, your niece, Khadija bint Khuwaylid radiallahu anha. And at that point in time, the nikah goes through and they perform the nikah. Now, here is some interesting um, details that are mentioned in some of the books of narrations. It said that Abu Talib at the time of the nikah actually addresses the family of Khadija radiallahu anha and says, I want you to understand who this young man is. That he's, yes, he's very honest, he's very trustworthy, he's very nice, he's very respectable. But what I want you to understand is that he's very special at the same time. I want you to understand how much work, how much effort has gone into taking care of him, protecting him and raising him. His father died before he was born. His mother died when he was a child. His grandfather, the great leader of our people, raised him for as long as he could. And since that day, I've been raising him. 
And we all, everybody who's come into contact with this young man knows one thing. There's something very, very special about him. So I want you to understand that when, when this marriage, this nikah takes place, that you people are receiving basically a treasure. That he addressed Khadija and he goes, you are marrying the most amazing man that I've ever known. I love this man, I love this young man like a child, like my own son. But there's something very special about him. So I want you to understand this blessing. Some of the books of narrations, and I only mentioned this. Now this, this is, this is interesting. All right, that's usually a sign of, you know, maybe some issues or some problems to come. Um, this is very interesting, and I only mentioned this because of. I feel that there's a lesson in here. Some of the scholars in their books of narration, in their books of hadith, such as Imam al Bayhaqi um, uh, and Abu Khaythama and other scholars of the Sirah, they actually mentioned this that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when this nikah was taking place of his with Khadija radiallahu anha, they say that the father of Khadija radiallahu anha was there. He was alive and he was present. Unfortunately, because it was part of the culture of that time, it said that you know Khadija radiallahu anha's father was drunk, basically. At the time the whole nikah, the marriage was taking place, it was going down, he himself was intoxicated, heavily intoxicated. Now, this doesn't get in the way of the performance of the nikah because Khadija radiallahu anha was twice married before. She was twice married before, she was a widow. She can marry herself, even by Islamic law, she could marry herself. But so some narrations actually mentioned that the father, Khuwailid, was actually quite heavily intoxicated at that time. And the marriage happens, and the nikah happens, the ceremony occurs, and everybody's celebrating. And that's when he kind of starts to snap out of it. And he looks around and he says, what's going on over here? He said, it's a celebration, it's a party. He says, yeah, I see it's a party, but why is there a party going on? So they say, because your daughter is married. She married Muhammad. He goes, what are you talking about? I don't know about this marriage. I'm not, I'm not okay with this. What? I, nobody asked me. I don't know about it. Like you were sitting here the whole time. You're just drunk out of your mind. And said that he actually started to kind of cause a little bit of a commotion. Now, why did I feel that this was of any benefit to mention? Just for anybody who's been through that situation, our trouble with the in-laws is from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, okay? <laughs> so the Prophet ﷺ is having a little bit of difficulty here with his father-in-law, okay? So his father-in-law kind of is, he, he, and he really respects the Prophet ﷺ. He's like, Muhammad is a great young man. I love Muhammad, he's amazing. Nobody asks me though, right? So it's kind of that whole issue. And they're saying, no, you agreed, you accepted, you were sitting here the entire time. He says, I don't remember, is it, well, you were drunk, why, that, why is that our fault? That's your fault. And so finally, after throwing a little bit of a fit and everybody getting very nervous, you know, you know what happens if you've ever been around one of those situations, right? So, you know, there's usually a kid crying in some corner and somebody's mom is yelling at them, right? And it's, it's a really bad situation. So everybody's kind of nervous and a little worried about what's going on. And then when he kind of, kind of gets over the initial shock and gets over whatever ego, you know, issues or problems he was having, he at that point in time says, okay, here's the compromise. He says that if I agreed, which I don't remember because I was drunk out of my mind, all right, I was hammered, but if I agreed to Khadija getting married, then of course she's married because I gave my permission. And he says, and if I hadn't given my permission, I don't remember and all you people are lying to me, then now I give my permission now. And now because I said so, now Khadija is married to Muhammad. But only because I said so. Right? And that's usually the case. Alright, that's usually the case. So, word of advice to the youngins, alright, to the young people here. When you deal with a situation like that, it's usually just a little bit of uh, an ego issue that's going on. And you just gotta kinda smooth it over a little bit. Alright, you gotta put them in charge or at least make them feel like they're in charge and you'll be okay to go, inshallah. Alright? And this was recorded. Alright, so, but, so that's, that's one of the, 
incidents that's married, that married. That's one of the incidents that is mentioned from the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ to Khadija radiallahu anha. But again, I'll kind of uh, end, I'll offer the disclaimer that this is mentioned only in a few in, uh, you know, variations of the narrations of the seerah, but it's not mentioned by the vast majority nor any of the major popular books of seerah, but it is mentioned in a couple of places. So I thought it, might, it was just worth mentioning. But... So the Prophet, so that nikah takes place, the, the, the mahar of the Prophet ﷺ, the marriage gift that the Prophet ﷺ offers to Khadija radiallahu anha at the time of their nikah, at the time of their marriage was 20 goats. 20 goats, and some narrations actually say 20 camels. Alright, so there's both narrations that are mentioned. One says 20 goats, one says 20 camels. Why is there that type of a discrepancy? It's very easy to understand because there are words in the Arabic language which typically can refer to animals or livestock in general. So because of that, there's just a little bit of a, you know, variation there in some of the narrations. But it was 20 goats or 20 camels that the Prophet ﷺ offers to Khadija radiallahu anha in the mahar as a gift of marriage. Which by the standards of that time, and this is an opportunity to talk about that. By the standards of that time, it is a respectable mahar, but it's not extravagant. I know that sounds like a lot, 20 camels or 20 goats, right? Like, man, that's a lot of money, right? It's a respectable amount, no doubt. But it's not a whole lot, it's not extravagant either. Why? Because you have to take everything into consideration. That who the Prophet ﷺ is. Yes, the Prophet ﷺ isn't a very wealthy individual and he doesn't come from a very, very wealthy family, meaning the man um, who raised him, whose house he lives in, is not extremely wealthy either. But yet the Prophet ﷺ is still from Banu Hashim. He's still the, the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. I mean, he's, he's a very, very like respected, young, well-known person in Mecca. He comes from a very elite family of Mecca of Quraysh, all right? So he comes from the family which is considered the leadership of all of Arabia. Similarly, Khadija radiallahu anha is extremely wealthy herself and her father is extremely wealthy and they're also considered some of the leaders of their tribes, all right? So you have people of two very high standing in terms of their background, where they're coming from, you know, where they stand in society. And typically in those types of families when people would get married, the mahar would not be 20 goats or 20 camels, it would be more like 200 goats and 200 camels. So you see it's all relative. This is an issue within our deen. Israf, and similarly the, uh, on the other side, stinginess, these are all relative terms. These are all relative terms. Israf is relative. So when somebody who makes a million dollars a year, somebody like that, when they drive a $50,000 car, that's actually relative. That's actually not, I would be inclined, somebody asked me honestly, I wouldn't call that a soft. It's not. Just as long as that person meets their fara'id, and they do spend in charity, and they do give sadaqah, and they practice what they're supposed to practice, israf is very, very relative. Alright, so that needs to be understood. There are certain points in time when it can go beyond that because israf by definition is spending a little extra on a need that you have. Tabdeer is to spend without need at all. So when I have eight cars, that's tabdeer. That's not permissible in general. Alright, but if I make a very, very good significant amount of money, it's just the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like somebody's in a position like Abdurrahman bin Auf, all right, when Abdurrahman bin Auf got married and he comes to the masjid of the Prophet the Prophet sees him, he's got saffron rubbed all over his shirt. That's very, very expensive by the way. That's like taking like a $2,000 bottle of oud and like kind of dumping it and rubbing it all over your shirt. All right, that's very expensive to put it into some terms that we would understand. All right, so he's wearing a very, very nice shirt that has saffron rubbed all over it, za'faran. It's got rubbed all over it. That's, that, that's like thousands of dirhams rubbed on his shirt. And the Prophet sees him. And the thing about saffron is they would wear a white shirt when they got married. And saffron was like orange, yellowish colored. So you could see it on the shirt. And that's why the hadith mentions, Abdurrahman bin Auf came in the masjid of the Prophet and he had saffron rubbed all over his shirt. Because you could see it rubbed on the shirt. And the Prophet met him and congratulated him and everything. And didn't say, well, what's this doing on your shirt? What's wrong with you? Right? He didn't, he didn't, he didn't reprimand him. 
So we see from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ as well and from his approval, وَتَقْرِيرَاتُهُ That means it's part of the sunnah that israf is very relative. So for the Prophet ﷺ to be giving a 20 camel, 20 goat mahar to his wife is actually very, very balanced. It's very balanced. It's very modest. He's not giving something extravagant because the families of Quraysh, when they would marry, they give two, three hundred camels as mahar. So this is very modest mahar. But at the same time, I say, I, I, I specifically mentioned that it is a respectable amount though. It is a respectable amount. And that's also part of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Mahar aqal, which is minimal mahar, is for situations where somebody doesn't have enough to give. Somebody has nothing to give. You know that hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, all right, just teach her some of the Qur'an. That's your mahar to your wife. Yeah, that's because he was poor. All right? So the stingy guy that gets married today and he says, yes, our mahar is I will teach her surah al-ikhlas. Right? Yeah, you're being stingy now. All right? That's bad. You're supposed to give a respectable amount. That's from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. They gave 20 camels, 20 goats. It was a very respectable amount. And so mahar should be very balanced and respectable in that regard. And, and that needs to be understood. When Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was getting married to the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, Fatima radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her. And the Prophet he asked the Prophet ﷺ, he goes, what about mahar? How much mahar should I give? The Prophet ﷺ told him to give a 500 darahim. As 500 silver coins. Alright, the equivalent of 500 darahim today, and, and you can't really do an exact like conversion of money because that doesn't work, but what it meant in that society, in that social context was 500 darahim, that'd be like a good 5,000 bucks, 10,000 bucks. He told him to give that in mahar. Now of course, as long as it's within someone's means, and it was within Ali radiallahu anhu's means, or he told him to make sure it was within his means, all right? But nevertheless, it should be a respectable amount. There's a lot of imbalance that happens in these conversations. There isn't one extreme that exists out there. The extreme that unfortunately exists out there, and I wasn't familiar with this because, you know, I was born and raised here in Dallas, all right, in America, we don't, you know, just talking outside of the Muslim community, what's mahar? I didn't know mahar until I started learning Islam, right? And then my parents are from Pakistan, so being of a Desi background, mahar isn't something that's given a lot of significance or value. It's kind of a religious formality of marriage a lot of times, and a lot of Desi cultures, all right? Only when I became accustomed to uh, Arab culture, current day, modern day Arab culture, did I, was I very shocked to find out what mahar is like in those cultures a lot of times. $50,000, $100,000 mahars, all right? Which is making it very difficult for young people. <laughs> Brother just got shocked. So, um, that which is making it very difficult for young people to get married today. It's actually very, very difficult. And so it's, it's problematic. But the solution to solving one problem is not to create another problem. The opposite extreme was, we started preaching, and the rhetoric can get a little out of hand at times. So we started preaching about simplicity, and that's great and fantastic, that's awesome. But it doesn't mean that we all of a sudden cheapen the idea of mahar. Mahar is an express, it's a gift, it's an expression of gift and love and generosity towards one's spouse at the time of marriage. Ten bucks don't say that. All right. Of course, relative to your situation, mashallah, if that's your, that's, your, that's your position, that's your situation, then more power to you. With all due respect. Right? But if, you know, you, you have to give a respectable amount because it is a gift. And we see that from the life and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So there always needs to be balance in these conversations. Always there should be balance in these conversations. So the mahar of the Prophet ﷺ was 20 goats or 20 camels, as the different narrations mention. And then of course they were married at that time. We'll be talking more about this as we go on forward through the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, but to basically give you a real basic overview. The Prophet ﷺ was married to Khadija radiallahu anha for 25 years. They were married for 25 years. Even though it was a practice in Arabia, a very commonplace practice in Arabia, particularly for people who were in a position, like who came from the elite families, to have multiple spouses, polygamy was very, very common in Arabia at that time. And later on, something that the Sharia of Muhammad ﷺ would allow for as well. In spite of that fact, the entire 25 years that the Prophet ﷺ was married to, Khadija radiallahu anha, he never took another wife. He never took another spouse. 
Why? Allah Ta'ala Alam Allah knows best, but the scholars do go as far as saying that not that the other marriages of the Prophet ﷺ weren't as serious, but there were other wisdoms, there were other issues at hand later on in the Medinan period. There were very, very deep wisdoms in many of the different marriages of the Prophet ﷺ, but it's very, very obvious even from the behavior of the Prophet ﷺ, years after the passing and the death of Khadija radiallahu anha, that this was the soulmate, the life mate, the, the partner in life of the Prophet ﷺ. This was the love of his life. He was deeply in love with this woman. They bonded together. They lived their life together. They were married for 25 years. Just, and he was never married to anybody else during that time. With, the, with Khadija radiallahu anha, the Prophet ﷺ had six children. She bore six children um, for the Prophet ﷺ. They had six children together. Two sons and four daughters. The first of their children was a boy by the name of Al-Qasim. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ very endearingly used to be called and used to like being called Abu Al-Qasim. And he used to love the title Abu Al-Qasim so much that it's actually mentioned in a hadith of Jami' Tirmidhi. Imam Tirmidhi mentions this hadith that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum used to discourage each other. Even if somebody had a son named Al-Qasim, if some, even if somebody named their son Qasim out of love for the son of the Prophet ﷺ or whatever, or they just liked the name, they used to discourage each other from calling that person Abu Qasim. Because only call the Prophet of Allah ﷺ Abu Qasim. He used to love the title Abu Qasim because he used to remind him of his first child. And anyone who has many children, you love all your children. But the first child is the first time you experience many things. It's the first of your experiences. Right, like these days, now that we have smartphones, when you have a fir your first child, you're basically like this the entire time. Right, you take pictures of everything, you record everything. Right, everything is unbelievable, everything is amazing. You blog about everything, you Facebook everything. Right, it's your first child. And so the Prophet ﷺ, and this shows you the human, human side of the Prophet ﷺ. He was a very loving man. He was a very caring individual. I talked about how, and you can um, go back and check in the Sira podcast, when we talked about the parents and the grandfather of the Prophet and Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet the Prophet always had, even though he lost his parents, he always had a loving, caring, compassionate individual taking care of him. And he was always loved. He was always showered with love throughout his life. And so the Prophet by himself, through his upbringing and by nature, you know, Ra'uf, Rahim, these are characteristics of the Prophet He was a very loving, compassionate, caring individual himself. And so the Prophet was an amazing father. And so his first child was an unbelievable experience for him. A boy named Al-Qasim. And so for the rest of his life, the Prophet ﷺ used to love being called Abu Al-Qasim. And this son, Al-Qasim of the Prophet ﷺ, he died, the books of Sirah mentioned when he was a few years old. So he was probably like a, like a small child, a small boy, three, four years old, when he passed away. Uh, some of the books of uh, Sirah um, or narrations um, also mention that that the son of the Prophet ﷺ, Al-Qasim actually reached the age where he was old enough to actually start learning how to ride an animal, which was probably around four, five, six years old. Kind of like when, around the time when we start teaching our kids to ride a bike, four or five years old, they used to teach their kids to ride a horse. And so it said that he was old enough to start learning how to ride an animal, and the Prophet ﷺ was the one teaching him, teaching his son how to ride a horse and an animal, and that was around the time when the son of the Prophet ﷺ, his first child, Al-Qasim, passed away. After that, the Prophet ﷺ and Khadija radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her, they were blessed with four daughters in a row. Uh, the first of them was Zainab. The second one was Ruqayya. Ruqayya. The third one was Ummu Kulthum. The fourth one was... Um, Fatima radiallahu anha radiallahu anhu najma'in may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with all of them and these were the uh, four daughters of the Prophet sallallahu and they were the next four children out of all four of them they were all basically they lived to the time to see the nubuwa the prophethood of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they all accepted Islam of course and three of them the three older daughters Zainab, 
Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum, they three passed away during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. And um, Zainab radiallahu anha passed away from, and we'll be talking about this later in the seerah, but she passed away from the eventual infection and you know difficulties that she had, health problems she had after a very serious injury that she suffered while making the hijrah from Makkah to Medina. She was attacked while making hijrah and she suffered that injury and eventually died later on due to complications from that same wound, that same injury. Uh, Ruqayya uh, suffered from a very serious fever and um, she eventually ended up dying. This was around the time of the Battle of Badr. That's why Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anhu was not present in the Battle of Badr. He actually was getting ready to leave and go out with the Prophet and the Prophet saw Uthman bin Affan, his son-in-law, the husband of his daughter, and he actually said, go back and take care of my daughter, take care of your wife Ruqayya. Which is something to chew on, something to think about. This is the Battle of Badr and the Prophet says, go back home and take care of your wife. That's another topic for another day, inshallah. But Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu goes back home, and eventually Ruqayya does die due to the same sickness, the same illness. And just as a little side note, since I kind of did touch on it a little bit, the Prophet ﷺ actually ends up giving Uthman radiallahu anhu a share of the spoils of war from the Battle of Badr. So he treats him just as if he was present in the battle, because he was home taking care of his sick, ill wife. After that, Uthman bin Affan, when Ruqayya passed away, Uthman bin Affan radiallahu was very, very sad. Uh, he was very stricken with grief, he was very sad. And eventually, after some time, the Prophet ﷺ married his third daughter, his fourth child, third daughter, Umm Kulthum. He married her again to Uthman radiallahu anhu. That's why he's called Dhunurain. The man who had two nurs, had two sources of light in his life. The two beautiful daughters of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa So he was married to Umm Kulthum. Umm Kulthum also became very ill and she ended up passing away. She ended up dying during the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu And Fatima radiallahu anha lived throughout the life of the Prophet sallallahu She witnessed the passing of her father alayhi salatu wasalam. It's actually even mentioned in a narration where she was actually very troubled by the passing of the Prophet sallallahu She came to see him the day before he passed away and she was sitting with him and she saw him going through the pain, the pangs of death and she's noted to have said, Wa karaba, wa karaba abata. Wa karaba abata. Look at my father, how much pain he goes through. And the Prophet ﷺ told her at that time, لا كرب على أبيك بعد اليوم. After today, your father will never suffer ever again. And so she witnessed the passing of her father, alayhi salatu wasalam, and it said that she was so overcome with grief and sorrow at the passing of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that she passed away six months after the passing of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So these were the four daughters. You had the first son, Al-Qasim, who passed away as a child, and the four daughters of the Prophet ﷺ, three of which passed away in his lifetime. The fourth daughter, Fatima, passed away six months after the death of the Prophet ﷺ himself. And then he had one other son from Khadija radiallahu anha, a boy by the name of Abdullah. A boy by the name of Abdullah. And it said that the Prophet ﷺ had a couple of nicknames. Like you have nicknames for a child, that the Prophet ﷺ had nicknames for Abdullah, he used to refer to him as At-Tayyib. At-Tayyib, the beautiful one, the pure one. And he used to refer to him as Tahir, the pure one, the clean one. So he used to refer to him as At-Tayyib, Tahir. And so many people used to call him out of love, like once a kid gets kind of a nickname, Everybody calls him by that nickname, so oftentimes, and that's why sometimes people get confused when reading the seerah, because they're like, no, the Prophet had a son named Tayyib, he had a son named Tahir. And the Prophet used to be called Abu Tayyib by some people. Yeah, Abu Tayyib. Right? And, but what you have to understand is those were the nicknames of his son, Abdullah. And it's mentioned in the books of seerah, in the books of history, that unfortunately this, this last child, this last son of the Prophet ﷺ, Abdullah, he literally passed away within days of his birth. He passed away very, very soon uh, after being born. So it was like an infant death. And then the Prophet ﷺ later on, and we'll talk about this in the seerah later on, but the Prophet ﷺ, while we're on the topic, he was blessed with one more child, a, child by the, a son by the name of Ibrahim. He said, I name him after my great-great-grandfather Ibrahim. And he was born to the Prophet ﷺ from his wife, um, or from you know, one, of the, 
women, uh, it's, we'll talk about it at that time, but it's Maria Qibtiya, which you can refer to as a wife because she was like an Ummu Walad of the Prophet ﷺ, but she was originally given to the Prophet ﷺ as a slave. And later on the Prophet ﷺ had a child with her, so she's an Ummu Walad of the Prophet ﷺ, which basically makes her a free woman. So you can refer to her in that sense as a wife of the Prophet ﷺ. But nevertheless, um, he, she was uh, uh, this last child that the Prophet ﷺ was born to, the Prophet ﷺ from Maria Qibtiya, named Ibrahim. And it said that Ibrahim, this last child of the Prophet ﷺ also passed away when he was about 18 months old, a year and a half old. He was 18 months old, he was a year and a half old, and he passed away at that time. The Prophet ﷺ said at that time, إِنَّ لَهُ مُرْضِعًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ يَسْتَكْمِلُ رِضَاعَهُ The Prophet ﷺ was so overcome by, by just so much pain at the passing of this last child that it said that the tears were constantly streaming from the eyes of the Prophet ﷺ. Like even when he wasn't like actually like sobbing or crying, there were tears just constantly flowing from his eyes. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, when they saw that, they said, what's wrong, O Messenger of Allah? ya Rasulullah. And he said, I can't help this, it's the heart. And the Prophet ﷺ at that time said that because he, he, he missed his son so much, missed his child so much, that the Prophet of Allah ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed a wet nurse the Pro- that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed a woman to breastfeed, to nurse Ibrahim in paradise so that he can continue and he can continue to be taken care of. Like Allah has appointed a woman to take care of my son Ibrahim even in paradise. And so the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa had in total had seven children, six of them from Khadija radiallahu anha. And one of the very, very powerful things to note is that six of his seven children, the Prophet ﷺ ended up having to witness their deaths. Like he had to lay six out of seven children to rest, to lay them down in their graves. The f- a father had to do that. Six out of seven children. Can you imagine what that must have been like? The Prophet of Allah ﷺ was, for us, was a superhero. He was absolutely amazing. He was unbelievable. He was greater than any man who ever walked the face of this earth. He did miraculous things. He went on miraculous journeys. But the Prophet of Allah was also a man. He was also a human being. He was also a husband and a father. And he not only witnessed the death of his wife, but he witnessed the death. He lived through, survived the deaths of six of his seven children. Imagine what that must have been like. Sometimes it's very important that we appreciate this aspect of the life of the Prophet and understand the man. And again, I told you everything the Messenger of Allah told us about, he speaks from a position of credibility. When the Prophet talks to us about patience, he knows what he's talking about. You know when somebody quotes you a hadith on patience, you're like, yeah, yeah, it's easy for you to quote that hadith. It's easy for you to quote that. No, no, no. Yeah, he's just a messenger. If somebody's quoting the hadith to you who doesn't know what you're going through, that's fine. He's just a messenger. You should thank him. He still brings you something beneficial. But read that hadith. Listen to that hadith. And think of the man who spoke those words originally. That man knew pain. He knew suffering. He he knew what patience was. He was the epitome of patience. He was a pillar of patience. The, pro- the guidance from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi that's why it's so valuable, that's why it means so much. We talked about his parents, when he lost his parents, how he lost his parents. He loses his spouse, a woman he spent 25 years with, the love of his life, and then to witness, to survive the death of six of his own seven children. Imagine what he went through, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. So, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi of course, like I mentioned, he was married to Khadija radiallahu anha for 25 years. And so now we're at the point in time, the age of 25, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi begins his married life with one of the most amazing women who ever walked the face of this earth, Khadija radiallahu anha. And 
the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of course then begins his married life and we'll be talking about some of the things that transpired in his life shortly thereafter inshallah in the coming weeks and the coming sessions. The last thing I'd like to mention here again kind of touching on the topic of marriage because that is the, the crux of these last couple of sessions. We've been talking about the marriage of the Prophet Sallallahu to Khadija radiallahu anha. One very valuable lesson we learned from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is why was Khadija radiallahu anha, this is one of the most amazing couples, one of the most amazing marriages of all time. This marriage is like a role model marriage. He's a role model woman. She, um, he's a role model, um, the greatest role model of all time, Uswatun Hasara. And their marriage is a, a role model, is, a, is a, a, the standard, is something for us to look up to and aspire to in our own relationships and marriages. That's the blueprint of how to build a family. Follow the blueprint of Khadija and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But there are things that go into consideration to making sure that you put yourself in a position to succeed as much as we can, as much as possible. Some things are in the hands of Allah and we understand that. Tawakkul is there. But i'qil thumma tawakkal. We tie our camel and then we do tawakkul. What's tying your camel in terms of marriage? The Prophet of, why was the Prophet ﷺ interested in marrying Khadija radiallahu anha? Her character. She was honest. She was dignified. She was respectable. She showed respect to others. She was respected by other people. Jazakallah khair. And that's what made her such an interesting proposition for marriage for the Prophet ﷺ. That's why he was interested in her. Because of her character, her akhlaq, her personality. How she conducted, how she carried herself. Why was Khadija an amazing, one of the greatest women that ever lived? Khadija radiallahu anha. Why did this amazing woman consider the greatest man who ever lived? Of course, but at that point in time, she doesn't know that he's a messenger of Allah. What was the basis? What does she say? Why does she send the proposal? Why is she interested in marrying the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Again, she mentions his character, his nobility, his honor, his dignity, the way he carries himself, the way he conducts himself, the way he walks, the way he talks. That's why she's interested. The character of a man and the character of that woman. That's why they were interested in each other, that's why they were right for each other, and that's what made an amazing marriage. Very, very valuable lesson that we need to instill within our youth today. Because as I've talked about numerous times, we have one of two extremes. We either got people that marry solely based on superficial reasons, such as looks, or it might be money, or it might be you know, something else that's superficial. You know, a lot of times parents are solely interested in marriage for the sake of the last name of the person without the slightest bit of regard as to the character, the honor, the nobility of the individual, what that person is made of, what their character is, nothing. Right? But yes, you're supposed to look for a good family, but what def what's the definition? What are the parameters of a good family? Usually it's money. Typically it's money, unfortunately. And then we do have another extreme. It's a very small minority, but it's an extreme in our community. Where we basically, you know, some of the very overzealous religious youth, they think that hijab, and he's got a beard and she's got a hijab, automatic compatibility. That's it. Superficial religious qualifiers. She wears hijab, that's it. It's very religious, mashallah. You have no idea about the person's akhlaq, their character. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi married Khadija because of her akhlaq, her character. Her dignity, her honor as an individual. And she married the Prophet ﷺ because of that honor, that dignity, that akhlaq, that character. And that's what needs to be taken into consideration. That is, should be the primary consideration within a marriage proposal. Well, what about deen? Fadfar bi that deen? That's the problem. It's because we don't consider akhlaq and character a part of deen. That's the problem. Character and akhlaq is the crux of our deen. The Prophet of Allah ﷺ tells us that athqalu shay. فِي الْمِيزَانِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ حُسْنُ الْخُلُقِ That the weightiest thing, the heaviest thing in the scales of deeds on the Day of Judgment will be good conduct, good character. إِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ That was his first qualification as a prophet and a messenger. And that was his primary means of doing da'wah. His akhlaq, his character. So that's something we should always take into consideration, something we learn from the blessed life 
of the Messenger of Allah. May peace and blessings be upon him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to learn more about the life of the Messenger sallallahu May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to benefit from the life of the Prophet sallallahu And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq in the ability to model ourselves after the blessed Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nasakfirka wa natubu ilayki.